BJ says, uh, what are uh, what are y'all doing y'all. to prevent yeah, <laughs> yeah right, to, pre- like to prevent your organization from being compromised? Uh, obviously, two-factor authentication, but anything else? Also, once you have been compromised, what are you doing to gain control outside of changing passwords? Oh, my goodness. That's a bigger this is, question. This, so, this is a huge question. I suspect <laughs> something has happened. <laughs> well, That's really good, or, PJ. We'd love to hear more, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we'd love to hear more, but I, I suspect that maybe he has been, or he or she, I'm sorry, has been tasked with, from someone up above saying, well, what happens you know, if this happens, what are we going to do? And they're well, like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know can I share? Because having having been through this or with my my own uh, demo tenant. So, I mean, it's really my I've got some guest users on there, a couple different accounts, logins for it. I had MFA on all of them, but one. And the reason it was turned off for one. And you probably this scenario you're familiar with this because I was doing some other third party site and it was running into the MFA block. Mm -hmm. I turned it off to do that. Forgot to turn it back on. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Mm -hmm. so that happened. So it got hacked. It confirmed. They went in there with with some data and it's fine. What I did, I went in and I turned on MFA. I, if there had been any business data within it, it's a demo tenant. So there's nothing in it. I'm lucky. I did a backup, cleaned up, was right back out there. It was an annoyance. But when that happened to me, I had two clients, both that got hacked and got ransomware. And so it was a major issue. One of them said, took the loss on the data. They lost about a week's worth of data. The other one, they were in the middle, middle of restructuring a site and doing a bunch of other things. They paid a hefty fee to get it back and then locked it down after that. So, so yeah, they actually, worst case scenario, they paid to get it back. They tried, and these are these are Microsoft people, you know, like yeah. uh, like community people, MVPs at the organization, and they went through everything, racking their brain of like, what can we do? And it just they they caught them at the worst possible time while they were restructuring and getting ready to relaunch, and their guard was down. So. Uh, you know, look, it's a horrific scenario. I don't know how big the impact of this is, but that's where my first thing is like, first go and shut, like stop the leaks, shut yeah. it down MFA in all at all points there, but two, and go and look at what is the risk profile? What did you potentially lose there? Um, what do they have access to? And so go and do an audit of that um, to see if anything has been misplaced. Of course, other things to go and do is scanning the system, looking for any malware, any other any other suspicious things that are on there. Um, if you're safe to go back prior to the hack and restore back to that data to wipe out any potentially malicious code or anything else that was placed back there. But yeah, it, it, it's rough because it's it's it could be a lot of things that could happen. Well, when you take a look at whether the question itself, it says, you know, what are y'all doing to prevent organization from being compromised? Uh, compromise could mean a thousand different things, yeah. right? It, you're talking about a specific ransomware type of situation, but it could be a social attack. It could be, you know, a simple little phishing attack. It could be um, IP, uh, you know, intellectual property. Uh, you know, uh, stolen, things like that. So there's all kinds of different compromises. So we'd have to kind of, you know, and there are companies that um, that I've worked with in the past that have these really comprehensive layouts for, you know, one kind of attack, this is the process. Another kind of attack, this is the process. Another kind of uh, attack, this is the process. So they have it really established. Um, but then again, there are companies who, you know, haven't invested in that. They don't they don't know what to do. They just have one big game plan that if we're hacked, we're going to do this no matter what the the compromise consists of. But I think that when you talk about 2FA, um, you have to be really clear that there's there's weak 2FA and there's strong 2FA. All right. Using your phone as a 2FA for text messages or SMS, that's very weak. Okay, it's very, it can be hacked. Man in the middle can pull that easily. 
um, and it's been proven. It's 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 a terrible terrible way uh, to do your multi-factor. But when you get into the the actual like uh, using apps, okay, for your MFA um, and getting verification codes and having backup codes, um, and even going so far as to having physical keys like UV keys, um, mm-hmm. that is very strong MFA. Okay, and you can't you can't really hack that. You can't duplicate that, right? A hacker can't get in there. Um, so if you were going to talk about two FA, uh, you know, or MFA, um, if you're going to talk about that, you have to talk about what degree that you're going to do it. Because if it's just simple text, which surprises me that like banks, you know, still do text messaging uh, and email yeah. verification. I'm like, it's so easy for me to log into somebody else's email and get the verification yeah. code. I mean, how hard that be. Um, but that's all they require. So it's very weak, um, you know, um, and to me, you have to you have to you have to gauge that you have to say, are we going to invest in something that's really secure? Um, will it make our users, you know, some users just don't want to have to enter a password twice or use a physical key or do anything, they know, make it easier for them um, in some verticals, you know, like healthcare and stuff. They just, you know, it's like if I got to do more than you know, one thing to get into a, a terminal, it's a waste of my time um, kind of a thing. But, you know, those are all things I think you have to think about. Um, I do want to express one thing before, and I'll, I'll shut up after this. Um, but I and not recently, uh, like within the last two months, um, there was a company that got uh, ransomware and they got it uh, actually from a uh, vishing attack. So, you know, phishing, right? Comes through yeah. email. Now they yeah. have vishing. Back um, on the boat. Yeah, yeah. They have the they have the vishing with a B. Um, and that actually comes through on your SMS, you know, on your text and you click the link and you do all that kind of stuff. Anyways, um, they got that uh, from a person that was work doing uh, scheduling. So uh, they would go in and they would schedule appointments for these uh, these uh, medical people. And uh, they actually got a text message um, and uh, they clicked on it. And when they clicked on it, it opened up a, a website on their phone. And then the website on their phone said, um, enter your email address, you know. So they entered an email address. Then they were able to actually get into, um, you know, using different social techniques to get in. Anyways. They got in, they locked the files, okay? Uh, and as it turns out, they were like, well, we're not gonna pay this. And uh, in conversations with the security folks that were working with them, I'm like, did they really understand, you know, if you have to start over what the impact is? Um, and again, I said, then think about the opposite side because this happened at a major hospital here in the United States is they paid the ransom they didn't unlock the files and they paid the Bitcoin ransom and the, the people disappeared and their files are still locked. Uh, so, it, you know, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. there's always that possibility. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to add that, uh, you know, one, one of the preventative things that I wish more companies would do it. I mean, I do this with my family, with my kids, with my wife is to make sure that my last company, they regularly tested, like sent out dummy emails, dummy phishing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, dummy text things to test people. And then like right away, like you failed, like you just click, like, why did you click on this? And did you not see that it was, you know, then, you know, uh, the, the, the dummy, like it was wrong. If you, I mean, you could float over a link with your mouse on your PC. You can see, Hey, that's actually going to John Smith dot com site, not to what, who they claim to be. And yeah. so now, of course, uh, it's becoming so much more familiar, uh, you know, getting the texts, the random texts that you don't know who the person is. I never click on anything. If I see and get an email, get a text for anything from a place claiming to be my bank or my credit card or whatever that is, I will use it as a prompt to go then I'll go log in directly into the site, go log in, look at the system messages. I'll tell you about half the time I look and say, yeah, there is no system message. That was a fake, yep. you know, message. So I like, I so I, that's one way to get around that is I use those as a prompt to go. And if you're not sure, go and do the native login um, to that site or to your company site to see if it was a legitimate request, 
you know, to do, but. Yeah, and I know BJ is asking also outside of MFA, what else could he be implementing or thinking about? And, you know, credentials, honestly, they they really are, or at least identity is you kind of the primary at attack vector. Uh, and I think beyond MFA and, and using strong MFA, um, like Mike said, with an app, you've got to start looking at what's the future of, of the way that organizations are being attacked and what have you implemented in a more modern way to combat that? I think of things immediately like, are you going through passwordless authentication? That's the first step, right? Get rid of your passwords. Uh, start looking at what are new ways, new technologies, Windows Hello, uh, you start using your biometrics, uh, using apps like the Authenticator app. So you're, yeah. you know, it, it's on your person, it's uh, on your device that can be managed by your organization, uh, really secure uh, that you can get access and open up that particular account. Uh, and then of course we still have the uh, FIDO2 security keys. So there's a few ways you can start looking at other alternatives or additions, I'm sorry, I should always say additions uh, to uh, MFA. Um, but there are more more things that you can do. Mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend if you're really worried about access to your M365 environment, um, one of the strongest things to do is at least uh, privilege admin access accounts. Uh, you should not have any standing admin accounts out there that have passwords assigned. They should be inactive or at least not have a password uh, in them, meaning that you have to use some sort of privileged identity management or access management process in order to utilize those admin accounts. So um, securing your admin accounts, extremely important. I think leveraging things like secure score, um, go out, take a look at Microsoft uh, secure score. That will give you an overview of your entire M365 tenant and the level of risk that you are allowing with the configurations that you've set in the services that you're running. And it will start to give you a glimpse into, oh my gosh, there is that one MFA account uh, that we removed, we forgot to add back because we were doing some work, uh, it was bothersome, whatever the case, uh, it will be identified and you can take action. Uh, to me, having a secure score review at least weekly to take a look at what's changed, what's been updated um, and right size your risk work with your security team, know what you are able to allow and what you're able to um, actually put a lot of uh, coverage over. And then of course, always the audit log, right? You can get a lot of access to sign in activity logs in Azure Active Directory to review. You can get alerts, you can set alerts when things are on uh, somebody who is located in the US and they sign in from another country, chances are uh, they are probably not in two places at once. So set up your alerts, make sure you're getting all the right people notified um, when different strange things are occurring so you can take immediate action. And I think um, some of those key things that I mentioned will help you go down that road, uh, BJ, um, and, you know, to get more control of what's happening and obviously to reduce the risk inside of your environment. I would I just add real quick too. I know that you know uh, this is kind of a Microsoft centric uh, type of of uh, cast, right? Um, but there are tools that are outside of the Microsoft uh, realm that cover more of a larger footprint than just M three sixty five. Um, and I would recommend some of them, like CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike's like a, a, mm -hmm. an, an incredible piece of uh, a piece of, uh, of software that um, you know gives you a lot of information um, but just so you know I mean if you're talking just beyond the the, the Microsoft uh, protection um, and Microsoft does expand into other areas outside of Microsoft as well I mean they will take a look at your AWS footprint and all that other kind of stuff um, inside of security um, but for an overall uh, reaching every you know, all your endpoint points from your firewalls to your, you know, your your ingress points and your egress points um, in and out of your company. Um, you may want to look at something that's a little bit has, like I said, covers a bigger footprint.